They're practicing, huh? <laughs> wonderful, wonderful. Good to see you all tonight. Hope you didn't have to cross over any down trees or anything to make it this evening. And don't pick up the down power wires for sure. But uh, glad to be in this place. Glad we got lights tonight. Amen. Flickered a little bit, but they're still here. Does anybody remember the service when the lights went out? Remember that? Everybody started. Uh, th those things are great. They make memories. They really do. I remember everybody scurrying to try to find something to flashlights, anything that we could find. And, and we had church anyways. Uh, and a uh, very memorable time. Uh, and that, that's, uh, that's one of the good things, I think, about pushing through tough times. Even when it's snowy days and difficult days, you say, we'll only, we'll only have a few in church. That's all right. That could be a memorable time in the house of the Lord with just a few. Uh, you don't need a thousand people to make it a great time in the house of the Lord. I remember once when I was a youth pastor, uh, I worked real hard to plan a big uh, youth event. And uh, Sarah, remember this. We had one teenager come. Now you say, well, what, what, our youth, our, se our, teen, our senior high class was 100, over 100, wasn't it, 80? And you had in the junior high, there's another 50. And, of course, I was just, we were rookies at, at doing this, and we put our hearts into it, and one showed up. And that was the previous youth pastor's kid. <laughs> so I thought, what are we going to do? We got all this stuff planned. What are we going to do? And. Uh, the previous youth pastor, who's Dan Wolven, said, you make it the best you can for that one. And uh, look, it doesn't matter to me whether we have a service with three or 300. We just worship God the best we can and enjoy the Lord and the word of God and prayer and singing. And, and um, so I thank you for being here tonight and thank you for your faithfulness. Um, we have been on the subject of, of worship. And Brother Mike, that was a great... Uh, time in the Word of God, and, and um, I appreciate all that you and your wife do in coming early and setting everything up, and uh, I always know that Mike and Dee are the first ones here uh, to get a lot of things ready in the background, and um, uh, thank you for their um, servant's heart in, in doing that. Can we all turn to Acts chapter number 16? Acts chapter number 16. Worship's value. We have been Sunday nights on worship. Wednesday nights is the book of Jeremiah. I don't know if I've ever had, you know, for all three services, series going. I don't think I've ever done that in my life. It's just the way it sort of worked out with this. The family in the morning, worship Sunday nights, and then Jeremiah on Wednesdays. Worship's value. Really just two points tonight that I want us to uh, see and, and uh, take a look at in this great story of worship, an unusual story of worship. We'll start in verse 19 of Acts chapter number 16. And I know this is familiar territory for many of us. We've read the story. We know the story. We know the events. But um, it's still as many times as I've read it and studied it and preached it and enjoyed it, uh, it still ministers to me as being an awesome example of worship. And so verse number 19, and this did she, I'm sorry, verse 19, and when her master saw that the hope of their gains was gone. And by the way, this was a woman that Paul and Silas, by the power of God, healed. They were using her body for devilish things. And now they're all upset because they can't make money off her anymore. It's an evil society, isn't it? Just an evil society. Look, uh, we're not the only ones to live in an evil society. It's always been. It's always been. So they caught Paul and Silas and drew them into the marketplace unto the rulers and brought them to the magistrates, saying, These men, being Jews, do exceedingly trouble our city. Now, what trouble did they cause besides helping a woman be freed from her bondage? They brought trouble to, they brought trouble to their wallets that's what they did verse 21 and teach customs which are not lawful for us to receive neither to observe being romans that's a that's a lot of spin right there and the multitude rose up together against them and the magistrates rent off their clothes and commanded to beat them and when they had laid many stripes upon them they cast them into prison 
charging the jailer to keep them safely, who, having received such a charge, thrust them into the inner prison and made their feet fast in the stocks. Now here it is. And at midnight, Paul and Silas prayed and sang praises unto God. And the prisoners heard them. Suddenly there was a great earthquake, so that the foundations of the prison were shaken. And immediately all the doors were opened and everyone's bands were loosed. And the keeper of the prison, awaking out of his sleep and seeing the prison doors open, he drew out his sword and would have killed himself, supposing that the prisoners had been fled. But Paul cried with a loud voice, saying, Do thyself no harm, for we are all here. Then he called for a light and sprang in and came trembling and fell down before Paul and Silas and brought them out and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? And they said, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved, and thy house. And they spake unto him the word of the Lord and to all that were in his house. And he took them the same hour of the night and washed their stripes and was baptized, he and all his, straightway. And when he had brought them into his house, he set meat before them and rejoiced, believing in God with all his house. And when it was day, the magistrates sent the sergeants, saying, Let those men go. And the keeper of the prison told this saying to Paul, The magistrates have sent to let you Go, now depart, now therefore depart, and go in peace. I like this story. It's a great story, isn't it? And let's remember, it's not just a story. It's an event. It's a historic event. It's a historic event that took place many years ago. The prison really did shake with an earthquake. And the chains really did fall off. Right? Right? And they really did come out, and the keeper of the prison really did say, what must I do to be saved? Boy, I'd love to have that happen to me. Just tell me, please. What could, that really happened. And the man did get saved, and all of his family and his household did get saved the same night. What a great, great event. But what I want you to notice, we're on the subject of worship on Sunday nights. Uh, and that worship is, is seen in this text. I know you saw it. At midnight, Paul and Silas prayed. This is verse 25. And sang praises unto God, and the prisoners heard them. There's two things about this worship. I'll save the third for next Sunday night. Uh, so tonight will just be two of the three. But I want you to know that worship's value or worship's worth can be found in two things. It's durability and it's portability. It's durability and it's portability. You know, something will cost you more if it's more durable. You want shoes that will last longer, they'll cost you more money. You want clothes that will last longer, they will cost you more money. One time I remember I tried to do the, the cheap Carhartt clothing. It wasn't Carhartt, it was cheaper kind of clothing. And some of you guys that work will know, it looks good and feels all right until you start working in it. And that fabric that whatever they use that duck fabric whatever it is it just didn't seem to wear and be as durable when the when the work had to be done it just didn't seem as durable as as the real deal right i want to ask you tonight how durable is your worship how durable is it how easy is, is it for it to get a hole in it how easy is it for it to get worn out how easy is it for you to cast it aside? Because I'm looking at Paul and Silas here, and even though everything was thrown at them but the kitchen sink, their worship stuck. Their worship stuck. I put it this way. They had Christ above their circumstances, Christ above their crises, and they had Christ above their critics. I mean, they were surrounded by people who were it, uh, 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 angered at who they were and what they were doing. Uh, as we read back there in verse number 19, these masters, these, these, uh, these uh, businessmen, they were, they, were, 
They were users. They were abusers of individuals and people. These businessmen in verse 19, they saw that the hope of their gains were gone. And so they were angry. And they said, we're going to make sure that everybody else gets against these guys. So they are gathering extra support against Paul and Silas. They are surrounded by enemies. In fact, it's a big show. It's a, it's a huge show as the magistrates in verse number, uh, let's see, where was it? Um, where they rent off their clothes. I thought that was interesting. Uh, in verse 22, and the multitude rose up together against them, and the magistrates rent off their clothes and commanded to beat them. So here's the multitude. Yeah, yeah, let's get rid of Paul and Silas. They shouldn't be doing this around our town. They're stirring up trouble around here. And the magistrates rip off their clothes in this big show as if to say, yeah, we're all right. Paul and Silas got to go. You ever feel like there's a big crowd against you? Yeah, let's get rid of them. Yeah, they're just trouble. We don't want them around. They're causing so much grief. And the, and the critics begin to go. You know, sometimes when the critics begin to build up in our life, we throw out worship. Well, how can I worship? I got so many enemies. How can I worship when somebody's saying things against me behind? How can I worship whenever there's all this uh, gossip? Or how can I worship when somebody's doing something against me? Well, there was no way for Paul and Silas to get a hold in their worship. And they wouldn't allow anybody to stir them off track. Do you know that bad days have nothing to do with a good God? See, I had a bad day. Bad days don't have anything to do with a good God. He's good on bad days, too. Good on bad days. And the durability of the worship of Paul and Silas. There will be times in your life where the durability of your worship will be tested. Let me give you some examples. When your car gets totaled, how durable will your worship be? Right? How, how sweet will your prayer time be? How melodious will your voice be as you sing praises to God? Is it, is it such that your worship will get a hole real easy? If your worship dies when your car gets totaled, then could we say that you are worshiping your car? Now just follow my thinking. If your car gets totaled, has God somehow become ungood? Has Christ somehow not changed from being the wonderful Savior he is to something or someone else? No, he's still the same. He's still the same. How about when the kids are rebellious? Will that destroy your worship? Will that take away the worship? Or can we say, you know, my worship stays durable even when there's problems in my life. When you're broke, when you're broke, I, I like that one syllable word, broke. It sort of makes it feel like what it is, you know, when you're broke. When you don't have anything else, can you still worship? See, here's the thing about real Christian, Christ-honoring music. And by the way, this is, the prison will separate the fakes from the real. Prison time will show who's real and who's fake. And when Paul and Silas were thrown into the prison, this is the test. Is their worship really that durable? We're going to put their feet fast in the stocks, and let's see if that changes their tune. We'll put them not only on the outside of the prison, but in the innermost part of the prison, where it's cold and where it's dark and where the, the maximum security is. We'll throw them in that section of the prison, and we'll see if they're really still going to be worshiping or not. And man, Paul and Silas pass with flying colors. When your health tanks, can you still worship? Real Christian worship is durable. It's durable. And you say, well, it's hard to worship when things are going bad. I get it. But it's more necessary to worship when things are bad because you've got to get your minds back on Jesus. If we cast off prayer, if we cast off worship whenever times are tough, then our problems are just going to get bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. So we say together, I've got to get my eyes back on the Lord. I've got to get my eyes back on Christ. I don't want my eyes and my mind and my heart to be on these other things. Do you know that you can't really worship God with a bad attitude? Now, I can come to church with a bad attitude. 
And by the way, I have at times. Don't look at me like you never have either. But you can't really worship God with a bad attitude. You can't really worship God when you're angry. You can't. You can't. Now, we can go to church when we're angry, but you can't really worship God when you're angry. You can't, we, we know this, you can't worship God when you're bitter. Impossible. That will cut off real worship from God when you're bitter. Uh, I think it's also hard to worship God when you're sleepy. I was thinking about that when these guys were at midnight. And they had been through it. But they sang and they prayed and they worshiped. These were big problems for them. These were serious problems. And I would ask tonight, is there anybody here that has experienced anything like Paul and Silas today or this week? Anybody here got beaten this week? Well, besides little kids, maybe got spanking, but anybody else got, uh, I can see, this, that's my luck, little kid. Yep, I got it bad this week, preacher. I really got it bad. <laughs> Like at church once, one of the parents, I remember, he had to carry his son out, and he put his son over his shoulders, big long aisle walking out, and as he was walking out, he said, everybody pray for me as he was going out. He knew what was going to happen. I don't think any of us have endured anything like this in our life, really. Beaten, thrown in prison, shackled up, feet in the stocks. I've never experienced anything like it. But this problem that they had, this tough time that they had, did not destroy their worship. I think it made it sweeter. Now, I wasn't there. I wish I was. I wish I could have heard them pray. You imagine what the prayer of Paul and Silas, and Silas was like that night. You, you put yourself as one of those prisoners who heard the prayer. Put yourself as one of those prisoners who heard Paul and Silas sing that night. Maybe their lips and their tongue couldn't sing as well as it used to because of the swollen parts of their face. But those prisoners heard him sing. Heard him sing. Look, every problem is, isn't something we should try to avoid. And parents, I, I, I guess I'll encourage us this way. Let's not try to save our kids from every problem. Well, that, that's happened a lot in society today. How dare you gave my son a C? How dare you give them a C? We're going to talk to the teacher. It's just not right. My son studied hard. He doesn't deserve a C. Let them keep the C and let them learn from it. Or, or, I can't believe they're not letting my boy play ball. He just sits there on the bench. I can't believe he's not playing. Let him deal with that. God will grow him through that, right? Because someday he'll want to get a job and he ain't going to get it. Let him grow through that. We don't have to rescue everybody from every problem. Paul and Silas were not rescued from this problem. But God used it to give them sweet worship. I like the song, I'm pressing on the upward way. New heights I'm gaining every day. I think Paul and Silas, even though they're in prison, it was sort of like a new height for them. How could you experience a new height in prison? It's by making sure that your worship stays durable. It stays durable. That's what makes worship so wonderful and so worthwhile is its durability. I also wanted to say tonight about worship's portability. Worship's portability. Uh, look at chapter number 15 and verse number 40 so we can get an idea of, of how Paul and Silas arrived there in that prison. I think we'll have a little sympathy for these guys. Worship's portability. And I want to tread on this carefully so that we can uh, understand the sense of it. All right, verse number 40 of chapter 15. All right, so Paul chose, and Paul chose Silas and departed, being recommended by the brethren unto the grace of God. So here we have Paul and Silas being the new team and Barnabas and Mark being the new missionary team. So it used to be Paul and Barnabas, and you can read ahead uh, earlier a little bit, they had a disagreement. And so now there's two teams. God used it to say there's now Mark and Barnabas and Paul and Silas. So Paul and Silas are going out on a missionary journey. They're going out for the Lord. Now as they go, look at all the places. I want you to think about this trip and see if this is a trip that you'd enjoy taking. 
So we see in verse number 41, the first place they went through Syria. Just take a note of these places Paul and Silas went uh, uh, to see how they finally got to the prison. First they're in Syria, verse 41, then Cilicia in verse number 41. Look at chapter 16 and verse number 1. Uh, then he was in, they were in Derby, in verse number 1. Uh, verse number 4 of chapter 16, and as they went through the uh, cities, so we're not really particularly know what cities they were, but they just had to go through some various cities in verse number 4. Then in verse number 6, where's the next place they went through? I'm hoping somebody pronounced that for me. Phrygia? 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 <laughs> Uh, that's the next place they went. And then also in verse 6, they went to Galatia, right? Region of Galatia. Uh, and then if you'll go down to verse number 7, here's the next place. Messia, Messiah. And then they wanted to go to Bithynia, but the Spirit suffered them not. Okay? So they avoided one particular place. But verse number 8, uh, they went from Messia. Where's the next place in verse 8? Troas. Uh, and Troas is verse number 8. Verse number 10, we have a, a, a new place that many of us may be familiar with biblically. And after they had seen the vision, immediately we endeavored to go into Macedonia. That's because the angel of the Lord gave them that vision that some people in Macedonia said, come on over here, give us the gospel. And so they said, we're going to Macedonia. We're going to start going there. But that was a long journey because first in verse number 11, they loosed from Troas. Okay. And then they came with straight course to the next one there, Samothracia. Samothracia. And then they went through another place called Neapolis. You'll see that in verse number 11. Um, then verse number 12, and from thence, where'd they go next? They went to Philippi, which is the chief city of the part of Macedonia and a colony. And we were in that city abiding uh, certain days. All right, verse number 12. And now we come to verse number 13. And on the Sabbath we went out of the city, they went out of Philippi, and all of it, Bible says, they went by a riverside where prayer was wont to be made. Um, and from the riverside is where they encountered this woman that God allowed them to give the gospel to, and then they're thrown in prison. So here's, here's what I want us to see here. This was a whirlwind trip. This is the kind of trip where your brain is spinning round and round. And this isn't like, you know, flying real easy and eating my peanuts and, and having my, uh, you know, Coca-Cola on the journey. This is hard travel, difficult travel, uh, uh, body-destroying uh, uh, travel. But wait a minute. How are they going to worship when they're not home? How is Paul and Silas going to worship when they left home 15 cities ago? They left their little group of believers a long time ago. The brethren said, we give you departure. So Paul and Silas, at the end of chapter 15, we give you departure. You guys are go with the grace of God. And Paul and Silas had to go alone, and they're traveling alone. And they're, of course, with the Holy Ghost, and they're traveling through these cities, trying to preach the gospel, minister to people, even going by Riverside to try to witness. How are they going to worship away from home? That's the next great thing about worship. It's portable. It's portable. <laughs> it's a wonderful thing about worship. It's portable. The portability of worship. I'll tell you how they took God with them. You don't only meet God here. Church isn't the only place where a man or a woman or a teenager or a boy or a girl meets God. Worship's portable. Uh, they did not learn how to worship in the prison. They already knew how to worship. So whether they were in Syria, Cilicia, Derby, Phrygia, Mysia, Troas, Macedonia, Samothracia, Neapolis, Philippi, by a river, or in prison... Paul and Silas already knew how to worship. And the location didn't matter. Everybody get that tonight? The, loca the location didn't matter. 
It's not as if Paul and Silas said, well, it'd be nice to do some worship in here in the prison. Wouldn't it be great if we were back in the sanctuary with the brethren? And we really have some good worship back there if we could somehow get back there. They worshiped where they were. They worshiped in a prison where there was no pastor. Think about this. They worshiped in a prison where there was no pastor. They worshiped in a prison where there was no worship leader. Brother Pat, there was no song leader. There was no special music to be sung to warm up your heart. There was no praise team. There was no choir to pump you up. There was no handshaking verse. There was no bulletin in your hand. There was no donuts and coffee. You're in prison. They were in prison. And they still worship. I'm just saying tonight, one of the great things about worship is it's portable. It's portable. Now, I don't want to destroy or demean or downplay church at all. And this is where I ask God to really give me wisdom and grace here. I don't want to downplay church. But do you know there's going to be times where you need to worship God and it ain't Sunday and it ain't Wednesday? Here's what I'm saying. It's not, going to be a, it's not going to be a Sunday. But you need to get alone with God and pray and sing. Talk to the Lord. Get in the Word. You say, well, I'll wait till Sunday. It's Sunday. I'll wait. I'll, I'll just give me a couple days. Well, you've already missed the sweet time. If you wait till Sunday. There'll be, there'll be days when you need to worship God and get a hold of God and get in tune with God and minister to your heart. And, and, and it'll be times when the pastor can't be present. It'll be times when the song leader can't be there. It'll be times where you can't bring up a, a choir number and you need to get a hold of God. Maybe it's at work. Maybe it's a Tuesday at work. And the computer gets a virus. And these... You know, the screens start flipping over and, and you got to call in the IT team and the boss is breathing down your neck and he's mad because you didn't get last week's project done. And you got coworkers who are just being an irritation. You know what you need to do there? Pray, get a hold of the Lord, sing a little bit, worship God, sweeten up your heart, and it ain't even Sunday. But on that bad day, Find a way to worship. Find a way to worship. Maybe it's a particular afternoon where you're waiting two hours for the tow truck to come get you. <laughs> Some of us have been there. It's, it's gone from bad to worse, and things aren't looking good, and this tow is going to cost me $300 probably to get it back to the shop. And then knows, who knows how much the shop is going to cost to fix this car up, and, and uh, this is a bad, bad, terrible, bad day. And it ain't even Sunday. Well, you know what you need to do? Get some worship going. I'm saying get a hold of the Lord. Start some sweet praying. Start some singing in your heart to the Lord. Make a melody in your heart to God. Confess some things to the Lord. Tell Him how great He is. Talk about His goodness. Sing some praise. Give some praise to God. Worship's portable. It can be done any place. Didn't the Lord Jesus say, Lo, I am with you. Always, I think it's always, but always, even unto the end of the world, amen. So my connection to God is not just on Sunday morning, Sunday night. My connection to God is not just on Wednesday night. My connection to God is full time, 365, seven days a week. And worship him, worship him. Prison didn't bother Paul and Silas, and these strange cities didn't bother Paul and Silas, and even going by an unnamed river didn't bother them. They were going to worship. They were going to worship. Worship's portability. I wanted to say this secondly, as I'm just trying to be careful on this, on this portability part. I believe when it's time for corporate worship, a Christian should be here. A member of this church should be here. When it's Sunday morning, Sunday night, you should be here. We should be here. And I think for a Christian who doesn't want to be here, there's some problem there. And I know things will hinder a believer at times from being here. But if we're able to, if we are able to worship with the brethren, we should be here. 
And if you have to miss Sunday, if you have to miss a morning service or an evening service, or if you have to miss Wednesday nights, it hurts, doesn't it? Can anybody else confess that it hurts? At least for me it hurts. When I'm away from the family of God and singing and worshiping and growing and serving, it hurts. It's like something's inside of me aching. And that's a good thing. But there will be times when a Sunday will roll around and you can't be here. Am I right, church family? There are times when a Sunday comes and you can't make it. I was thinking about you, Brother Matt, and I, I realize this was a different time in your life, but uh, you told me you opened up your eyes and you're in the intensive care at Metro Hospital. And the Sunday's rolled around and he ain't making it, you can't make it. So what do you do? Do you just say, well, I can't make it over to the church house, so I just can't worship. Oh, yes, you can. Oh, yeah, you can have sweet worship, even when you can't make it on a Sunday. When it can't be on the Lord's day, I know some of our church people have had to care for the elderly or, or a sick loved one. I thought about John and Sherry who cared for their mother for a long time. And I just uh, took part in a funeral for Teresa Huffmaker. And her daughter took care of her and, and her, her father for 10 years total. And both were shut in. And the Sundays, many Sundays would come and would go. And they could not get to the family of God to worship corporately. So what do you do? You worship in your prison. You worship where the shackles are. You worship where the prisoners are around you. And you worship. Worship is very much portable. And that's the wonderful part of worship. I want us to look at one more text and I'll be done. It's Psalm 63. I think uh, uh, David says this well under the inspiration of God as he talks about his worship. Psalm 63. Psalm 63. Does anybody have a, some, some Bibles have the titles of the Psalms. Now they're not, they're not inspired, but they give us some context of the Psalm. Does anybody have a title up, up there at the top of 63? Want to say what it is? Say it, Brother Matt. All right, he's in the wilderness of Judah. That means on, a, on the Sabbath day, he couldn't be, if you're in the wilderness of Judah, you're not being in, this, in, in the Lord's house on the Sabbath day. Are we all right with that? He just wasn't there. Okay. What kind of, and by the way, David was the kind of man who, if he could be in the house of the Lord, he was there. He's the one that said, uh, uh, how do you say it? Um, I, uh, uh, I was glad when they said unto me, let us go into the house of the Lord. That's David. I was glad when they said, let's go to the house of the Lord. David's the guy that said, I'd rather be a doorkeeper in the house of the Lord. David loved worship. Uh, music was part of his life. He, he loved worship. But now he's in the wilderness and he can't. So what does he do? Well, let's read this. And you see if you can sense David's worship, the portability of his worship. Oh God, thou art my God. Early will I seek thee. My soul thirsteth for thee, my flesh longeth for thee in a dry and thirsty land where no water is, to see thy power and thy glory so as I have seen in the sanctuary. Because thy loving kindness is better than life, and my lips shall praise thee. Thus will I bless thee while I live. I will lift up my hands in thy name. My soul shall be satisfied as with morrow and fatness, and my mouth shall praise thee with joyful lips when I remember thee upon my bed and meditate on thee in the night watches. Boy, isn't that something to think about how he's worshiping? On his bed in the night watch. Because thou hast been my help, therefore in the shadow of thy wings will I rejoice. My soul followeth hard after thee. Thy right hand upholdeth me. But those that seek my soul to destroy it shall go into the lower parts of the earth. They shall fall by the sword. They shall be a portion for foxes. But the king shall rejoice in God. Everyone that sweareth by him shall, him shall glory. But the mouth of them that speak lies shall be stopped. Now I don't know how you see it. But I see David out there in the wilderness of Judea just having a wonderful time worshiping God because he can't be in the house of the Lord. 
just trying to say tonight, this kind of worship tonight is sweet. When we're together, this morning service is a sweet time when we can be with God's people. But worship is durable. It'll last through problems if it's the real deal. And worship is portable. Do it where you are. Do it when the tough times arise. You say, well, I'll get to church and I'll go to the altar and pray. Pray where you are. Get on your knees where you are. Talk to God. You say, I can't wait to get to church. We'll sing a little bit. Sing where you are. Sing praise where you are. I like how the Bible says about Paul and Silas that they prayed and sang praises. And one more thing I want you to see in Acts chapter number 16, and then we'll, uh, I'll pray and we'll be done tonight. Acts chapter number 16. I wonder if you see it the way I saw it here when I was studying. Verse 25. And at midnight, this is uh, Acts 16, 25. And at midnight, Paul and Silas prayed and sang praises. What's the next two words? Unto God. But the prisoners heard them. Here's what I'll say and I'll close. It is, it is as if Paul and Silas didn't even realize anybody else was present. Because they're praying to God. They're singing praises to God. When the Holy Ghost writes it down, he writes it as if, yeah, they were just, it was just them and the Lord. But those prisoners heard it. Those prisoners heard it. Doesn't matter where you are or how bad life is, how tight the jam is, how short the money is, how heavy the burden is, how how deep the grief is. Worship, worship, worship. Enjoy the sweetness of worship with God. Can we bow just for a prayer tonight? How easy is it for Satan to knock off your worship? How easy is it for your flesh to disturb your worship? How much worry does it take to you can't pray? How much bitterness does it take to you can't sing? How much, how heavy does the chain have to be on your legs till you can't worship? Well, I, I take, I learn a lot from Paul and Silas. They weren't going to be held back. They weren't going to let no prison keep them from getting in touch with God. They weren't going to let no prisoners and no keepers of the prison and no magistrates who are tearing clothes off and beating them with rods. They're not going to let them destroy their worship. Don't let your bad day, a body that fails, a bad report from the doctor, no money in the bank, work is slim, kids won't call. Don't let that destroy your worship. You get in there with God and pray and sing, love the Lord. Give thanks. Worship has value in its durability and portability. Can we stand for a prayer today, just quietly? Father, I thank you tonight for allowing us to be here in this place. And we don't want to take it lightly. Very glad we can open the word. Very glad we could pray. Very glad we could hear a word from Brother Mike tonight. Hear the song from Brother Dan. Hear the girls play the instruments. Very glad we could sing the songs ourselves tonight. Isn't the love of Jesus something wonderful? We love these times of corporate worship. God, we admit tonight that sometimes... Uh, when we're abandoned by a friend or when we're when someone gossips about us, lies about us, when someone when some crises happens in life, sometimes we become silent. We don't want to pray, we don't want to sing. God keep us singing, keep us praying. Keep us worshiping on the worst of days. God, keep us worshiping on a Tuesday, on a Thursday, on a Saturday. 
Keep us worshiping on a Sunday when we can't be here. Keep our heart in tune. We thank you tonight for your blessings. And I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Our heads are bowed quietly and eyes are closed. Christians are praying. As I am without one plea, but that thy blood was shed for me. 